Hello and welcome to episode 28 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's episode is Stephen Feifke, an award-winning pianist, composer, arranger, band leader of several projects, and sideband to countless other projects as well. Uh, he is a Yamaha performing artist, and in addition to his work being certainly widespread and praised throughout the jazz community, he's also found his orchestrations make their way into pop culture and television shows like Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, Impractical Jokers, and The Animaniacs as well. Um, in this episode, diving in, we talk about uh, embracing writer's block as part of the composer's process. Uh, we talk about how records and arrangements, you know, are just a snapshot in time of where each musician is in the personal growth and a particularly notable gig from hell that became an entire vibe. So let's dive in. Moving on to the releases of the week. The first one I want to plug is Steven's first record as a band leader, which is called Peace and Time that came out in 2015. And you'll notice we talk about it in the episode. There's a couple tunes that follow a certain connective uh, dramatic thread that I am a little bit more drawn to that I wasn't aware of at the time, uh, but certainly makes sense now. And so I won't give that away. You can listen in and then go back and listen to the record as well. But uh, just really this album shows how genuine and thoughtful Steven is as a composer and band leader and pianist, just all the many different facets in which he excels. Um, and for his right first record to be a standout like this is certainly very inspiring. So if you want to support that record, you can go to stephenfeifkeymusic.com uh, and get a digital download. I just went and got mine today, and it's certainly the most effective way that you can support musicians by going directly to their website and finding whatever way they are either digitally or physical copy uh, making their music available. So also you can go and find his music on uh, all the streaming services as well on Spotify Apple Music, and he has plenty of stuff coming out, including a single uh, which is called Kinetic that's coming out on his uh, full big band record that will release in April, so keep an eye out for that. And then the next record, oh my gosh, this one is so exciting, and it features Steven as well. From the 8-bit big band, Charlie Rosen, the band leader and orchestrator of that group, who was our guest, I guess, three or four, about four episodes ago. Uh, the new record, Backwards Compatible, the third album from the 8-Bit Big Band just came out and it features absolutely stunning arrangements. Um, the Kid in Me wants this album to be the soundtrack to my life. Bar none. It is so much fun and the playing is just gnarly. Uh, everyone sounds so unbelievably good. So if you want to support this record, you can go over to the 8bitbigband.bandcamp.com. They have a pay what you want feature, which is really great for the consumer because obviously we're in a time where financial stability is kind of up in the air right now for a lot of people in different professions, not just in the music industry. So it was really great that Charlie made that as a pay what you want feature. Uh, but if you want to support that band, you know, make sure to uh, throw some love their way in the form of a donation or uh, downloading uh, this album. And I promise it is worth every single penny, no matter how much you decide decide to pay on Bandcamp. So go check that out and then follow them on all the social media platforms at the 8-Bit Big Band on Instagram and you can visit their website as well, the 8bitbigband.com. Um, and that is it for the releases of the week. Moving on to the Monk shows, of course, we talk about the pop-up jazz club turned brick and mortar live stream only uh, during the pandemic that is curated by Colin Shook. I just had my show with Thomas Winglinski that is available for playback. You can find that under the uh, Christian Wiggs and Thomas Winglinski sextet on YouTube if you just type in our names and then Monks, it's really easy to find. Uh, but the upcoming shows that we have is Ingebrigt uh, Flaten Trio with Colin Shook and Daniel Dufour. He is apparently amazing. I haven't checked out his work yet, but after hearing everybody's reactions when it was announced uh, during our show, I'm certainly going to tune in. That is this Sunday, January 17th. Uh, and then the next one is going to be the next installment of the Project Safety Net concerts that are presented by Austin Jazz Society in conjunction with Monks. That is going to be on Tuesday, January 19th, and it's going to be the Tarek Hassan uh, Quartet. Tarek, we plugged his uh, record Yala uh, several weeks back, and it's absolutely incredible. You'll want to tune into this. I'm sure they're probably going to be playing some arrangements off that record, um, or at least just things that are very similar. And then uh, next Thursday, January 21st, is going to be the Jonathan D's Quintet. 
Uh, Jonathan Dees is the pianist for uh, Gary Clark Jr. right now, and I'm sure has lots of amazing stuff in store for you and me as well. I can't wait to tune into that. So that's all of the announcements for today. Again, go and check out uh, Steven's new single, Kinetic. Go check out his first record from 2015, Peace and Time, and of course, support Charlie Rosen and the 8-Bit Big Band's new record, Backwards Compatible, as well. That's it. Let's dive right in. Here is episode 28, Stephen Feifke. This is Off the Bandstand. writing for big band for a really long time um when was like the first time that you were like writing big band charts uh, i wrote my first big band chart in high school <clears throat> it was a pretty unsuccessful endeavor but i got it out of the way and um it's been only uphill since then when i got to college i was at nyu i studied economics and jazz performance at nyu and i had some awesome teachers there um namely um Gil Goldstein was my primary mentor there, and he encouraged me and inspired me and um, critiqued me on my big band writing at that time. And then I also got the opportunity to write for the ensemble, the NYU Jazz Orchestra, through the conductor, Rich Shamaria. And so whenever there would be a guest artist coming in, um, I would be bugging Rich, saying like, hey, do you need help writing for this project? Like, yeah. I can write a chart. Yeah. And so it was kind of like a trial by fire thing. And like one of the first charts mm -hmm. I ever wrote was one of the first charts I ever wrote was for um, Stefan Harris, uh, a, a tune of his called The Velvet Couch. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of my learning process for the big yeah. band. And then you know, over the over the course of time, you start to find your voice. You start to find influences that really speak to you and start molding those into yourself. Yeah. For sure. Where did you come up, man? Like, was it was it a very musical community or was it something where it was just like the school has a band and maybe a jazz band? And, you know, where, where are you from? Yeah, I'm from Lexington, Massachusetts, which is about half an hour drive from Boston. So I grew up going to the New, the New England Conservatory prep program mm -hmm. um, and they had a big band there, but also the Lexington public school system had has still has an amazing music department and a really great jazz department. So the professor there was Jeff Leonard, Jeffrey Leonard. Mm -hmm. um, it's still strange for me to call him Jeff, but that's <laughs> his name. Yeah. Um, and he was a Berkeley graduate and he had <clears throat> these, he would bring in guest artists all the time. So like when I was at high school, he brought in Dave Liebman to give a master class. Mm -hmm. He gave, um, he got yeah. Makoto Ozone to come in for a week long series of master classes and concerts. And that was when I was a freshman. And that was probably huge, like one of the most formative experiences of my musical upbringing. Uh, Dave Berkman came. Um, and then the faculty at New England Conservatory was also pretty crazy. Um, my piano teacher was Dave Zoffer. Um, and yeah, so that was, that's where I'm from and kind of my musical yeah. <laughs> upbringing. For sure. Well, I'm, I'm curious what came first, because I feel like the natural uh, thing for a lot of people to do is um, to start with like classical fundamentals uh, or fundamentals, fundamentals. <laughs> and uh, right, uh, not enough coffee yet uh, at <laughs> one thirty eight my time. Um, but yeah, like I feel like most people start with like those classical fundamentals and like whether or not people continue music almost everybody can say, oh yeah, like my mom put me in piano lessons. It's kind of like the the classic thing that people say, but did you find that like the jazz idiom and, or at least the interest uh, found its way in like fairly early or what, what was like the musical focus, I guess, from whenever you first started playing and when did more, well, jazz being 
decades, decades old, hundred years old, but more modern? When did more modern things kind of start to seep into your your interest? Um, well, funny you should say, but my mom was my first teacher. My mom is, oh, cool. or she has been a long time, but my mom really was a fantastic classical pianist. Mm -hmm. And so she was my first teacher and I got, I kind of got the bug. Like when I was apparently before I could walk, I was like crawling over and like banging on this piano. <laughs> and so she just like taught me for, for many years um, from the age of four to like seven or something. And then I had another teacher, a Russian lady named Lena. And then I had a really fantastic teacher named Susan Capestro, who was a former student of Charlie Benakis, uh, who was a famous Boston teacher mm -hmm. who, since past. But anyway, um, <clears throat> and she is the one who got me into composing. And so before, you know, like as far as like classical fundamentals go, like I was playing classical pieces, learning classical technique, mm -hmm. all that, all that stuff. But really what I loved about music lessons, about piano lessons was the chance to compose and write. And so she would explain to me or assign me to like play a waterfall. Like I was, she was like, what sound would a waterfall make? And like, of course, like any little kid, I'm like, <laughs> Like that's a waterfall, and she's like, "Okay, now what happens when you get to the bottom of the waterfall?" And I would feel like crash, yeah. right? And she's like, "Okay, and then like, what happens to the water afterwards? Is there some sort of mist? Like, play the mist." And so I really had this kind of um, uh, the, my introduction to to writing and playing the piano in a formal way was one of expression and not one of technical study. So that's what I connected with musically and i think that that's still what i connect with most musically and as far as like more or less advanced topics or like when i got bit by the jazz bug yeah um that's kind of interesting too i mean she bought me my first couple of cds she bought me mccoy tyner soliloquy she brought she bought me uh the atomic count basie which is neil hefty arrangements for the basie band which has the kit from red bank on it um, she got me the Wynton Kelly Sextet, uh, which has some amazing flute writing, rare flute writing from Wynton Kelly. Um, so these are the things that like I latched on to when I was like 11 or 12 years old. And oh, okay. that's kind of still like what I latch on to in music. Um, McCoy Tyner is still one of my biggest influences. I mean, it only grew from there. And the more people I was exposed to, whether it was peers and colleagues, <clears throat> funny to call other 13 year olds, colleagues but they are <laughs> colleagues yeah. um or whether it's my ed my, my my educators my mentors um people i look up to like they would expose me to different musicians and say like hey have you checked out herbie hancock or hey have you checked out taylor Ixty? um those kinds of things and yeah yeah, yeah. that's really insane i don't know a lot of 13 year olds who are listening to mccoy tyner <laughs> uh or like even if they're listening to it, maybe by osmosis of like their parents listening to it, they're probably not very interested in it. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, really what we need to do, I think Stephen is, is promote uh, TikTok challenges of McCoy Tyner, get the younger generation in there, really starting to listen to it. So um, that is also a crazy thing. Like me and uh, Dan Shimulinski were talking about that, like how TikTok is starting to, make its way into like jazz musicians doing different stuff. Like he posts that stuff where he's like up here, down here. And I, I sound like a narc, like talking about TikTok. I have no idea really how it works. I just watch some things every once in a while. <laughs> um, well, man, that's, it's really fascinating to me to hear like the evolution of like your big band writing, because the first time that I had heard you was, um, I believe if I'm not mistaken, is either another pianist in town or it was my girlfriend's uh, brother who showed me I Got the World on a String and showed me like where Benny's singing on that. And I think that's what I mentioned to you. I, we briefly met, I don't expect you to remember it all. We briefly met at uh, Jazz Congress last January. And I was just like, oh man, like I really love that video. And you were like, oh, whoa, that was like a long time <laughs> ago. That was like, what, like six, seven years ago. Um, but I remember that being one of the first instances of listening to like a standard, like as a singer, like listening to a standard that was not just like, here's like a one, six, two, five thing. And then like the head and then solos and out, like it was, it was very like kind of dismantled. And that is very akin to like my interest with Kurt Elling and, and things of that nature. And, 
and um, uh, Gerald Clayton, right? Like whenever I heard If I Were a Bell from uh, the Bond sessions and just hearing the idea of dismantling tunes and putting very, very original sounds without being like disrespectful to the actual composition itself. So at what point were you thinking about doing those kind of things and taking that artistic liberty? Because that is a sort of branch to go off of and there's a real likelihood that somebody could just like slap it down and go no it doesn't work like play it the way it's written you know we've all played steakhouse gigs where people are like yeah i didn't recognize it as much and it's like mm, but creative license pleasing the audience you know balancing that act so what gave you that confidence to figure that out and when was that when you were playing like what age are you asking when i started arranging pieces so, i guess like a, like not so much just arranging but feeling like you could take well i guess you could say arranging like taking real liberties in changing up the idea of of even the melodic integrity of of a tune you ever heard the story of the of how thad jones like started his own big band uh no tell me okay which well basically what happened is that Basie, well, Thad was writing for the Basie band, like alongside, you know, Frank Foster and whoever else at that time. Um, <clears throat> and basically, like, basically, Basie commissioned Thad to write a whole album's worth of material. Thad brings in this material and Basie's like, uh, this isn't for my band, <laughs> dude. <Yeah. laughs> like, this is great, but this isn't the vibe of, like, you should take this and you should start your own ensemble. Interesting. And Thad's like, like i don't know what that said but he was like uh okay like let's pretend <clears throat> like uh okay i'll do that and that's how thad started his band right is that he had a bunch of material that was unplayed <clears throat> by the basie band yeah. um and i'm pretty sure that that's what you're hearing on all my yesterdays that first night of the vanguard um is that stuff that he wrote for the basie band and you can kind of hear like the influence and if you keep track of thad's writing over the next several decades several decades two three decades you also like see like an embrace of his own identity, him embracing his identity. So uh, funnily enough, the I've got the world on a string arrangement was a commission from somebody who will rename it nameless. And they wanted a chart for a singer on I've got the world on a string that included a trombone solely. And so I wrote this arrangement, took a lot of time and care, <laughs> gave it to them and they said i don't like this oh no and i was like i was like heartbroken yeah and then i was like wait a second like i like this yeah. like why don't i record this and so i recorded that and my favorite things at the same time and that's how i started my band is yeah. from that rejection so as far as what kind of thought process or like when did I feel comfortable doing that <clears throat> actually like that was a really important lesson for me to learn which is that when someone commissions you to write an arrangement like they're not asking for you to be a hundred percent yourself sure they're asking you to be yourself but they're asking you to be empathetic towards their ensemble and towards their musical vision so whenever I'm commissioned to write arrangements now I always have to like do this balancing act of like how much of myself do I put in like yeah. for instance, if I'm writing for my own ensembles, like it's like close, if not a hundred percent exactly who I am, unless yeah. there's like, you know, unless I'm writing, if I like, I, at this point I know the members of my band super well, so I can say, okay, this is gonna feature Benny on trumpet or Benny on vocals, or this is gonna feature Dan on bass, you know, Chimmy yeah. plays in my band. Um, you know, so I can say like, okay, what are they, what, what sounds would they wanna hear? And then maybe like the ratio is like, 90% or 80% me. Whereas if I'm writing for, um, you know, uh, well, there's a bunch of things coming out, but I'm not, when is this being released? <laughs> uh, this will release, actually, this is gonna release tomorrow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, in other projects <laughs> that are coming out <laughs> over the next couple of months, sure. you know, it's, it's a balancing act of finding like how much of yourself do you put into an arrangement and how much uh, do you hold back because you know that you're supporting an artist? It's like you're a side man or a side woman, whatever, but in my case, a side man. 
on a gig and you have to like give the music what the music needs. So um, I feel very comfortable like taking an, taking a song and, dism and dismantling it and putting it back together in ways that satisfy myself. But I'm also pretty comfortable in dismantling a song and um, letting and putting it back together in such a way that the artist that I'm writing it for will feel supported, him or herself. For sure. And it always helps whenever they like say, oh, I'd like this in the style of, you know, whatever, Basie's band, like, like at the, at the offset of the commission, right? Because then it gives you a little bit more of like a narrow place to, to draw from. Uh, but I'm sorry that happened, but I'm, at the time, <laughs> I'm you, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> And I think that is um, also a good point of like the benefits that certain sorrowful, um, uh, sorrowful, I actually just had another thought, but certain sorrowful situations uh, can like yield later on down the road. Like it doesn't make it any less painful in the moment, but then later on it's like, oh, well then that spawned this. And I think that is just a testament to most things like in or outside of music, but I think there's the thing that I thought of mid sentence. Isn't there a Roy Hargrove tune off of Ear Food called "Joy Is Sorrow Unmasked"? Um, I think, wow! Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's the name of the tune, and it now makes me want to go back and listen to Ear Food again with that kind of uh, instead of just being like, "Oh, this is the title of the tune," being like, "Oh yeah, like wonder if Roy had that in mind whenever he was writing that." Um, yeah. But something that you had said that that was one of the next things that I wanted to talk about was being a sideman versus um, being a band leader. And like those two, mm -hmm. it's a weird dichotomy, right? Because you still want to be able to contribute the same things that people admire about you as a band leader, but also ultimately have to like defer to the musical like idea and the musical style that that person's going for within their own band. Um, I'm sure it's probably just a very like, oh, there's just two sides of the coin, but do you find there's one side that you enjoy doing more, at least at certain points in life? Um, I just love making music. Um, I love music very, very much. And so it's, I think it is just two different sides of the same coin. I'm, I also feel lucky that the situations that I'm called to be a part of more often than not require my individuality rather than just a pianist. Right. Um, so that is like a very fortunate position that I find myself in and um, I don't take it for granted. Um, but I like being a sideman and I like being a band leader. Um, and my own big band is full of band leaders, you know, who are just also great sidemen, side people. Right. So yeah yeah and you had mentioned like i was uh looking at all of like the q a things that you posted last night on instagram um <laughs> there some funny ones there were some funny ones ben um but i i liked the the one where you were saying that um or at least just wanted to bring up whenever you said that uh uh and I don't want to be so uh, disrespectful to think that Spike and I are on a first name basis when I don't know him at all. And he, I, he does not know me at all. But like, just to use the, I guess, vernacular, uh, you'd said that like Spike had given you your first gig over at Smalls as a, as a band leader. How long had you been in New York before you had that opportunity to like lead a band? Uh, about two years. Um, so I was... I think I <clears throat> either I was 19 or I just turned 20 when I had my or like about to turn 20 or something like that. But I, I was going to like the the smallest jam session a lot um, yeah. late night and just trying to hang out and like, you know, I was at NYU. My dorm was a couple blocks away. I didn't have class on Friday mornings. So Thursday nights and Saturday nights, I would probably be at smalls just like checking out the bands, yeah. hearing the music, seeing if I could sit in. Um, so yeah, but yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't think that Spike would take that as any sort of disrespect. Um, <laughs> For sure. Like, For sure. Well, I mean, it's like, uh, I guess certain people who are of the larger generation or not larger, uh, the, the next generation of people, 
um, whenever I meet them, I'm, I'm always like very, I, I hope it doesn't seem like too like official whenever I do this, but I, I always kind of want to say like Mr. Elling, if I'm talking to like Kurt Elling or something like that, because it's just like, I have such reverence and respect for your playing. Like I would not want to just be like, oh, Kurt. And he's like, wait, who, who are you? Like, you know, like, I don't know. I just see, maybe it's that that feeling of, of wanting to uh, uh, adhere to respect. But anyways, um, yeah, for sure. And then you also talked about like getting an economics degree over at NYU. Was that the, the main track? I know you said you got a minor there. Was that initially the main track or was it always going to be music? And that just was sort of meant to supplement uh, being in the music business career. Uh, I went to NYU intending to study pre-med and jazz performance or jazz studies is what it's called over there. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that I didn't think I wanted to be a doctor. So I stopped that, but I was at one of the best academic institutions in the world. So I figured, okay, I want to study something else. I always had liked math, started studying math, <clears throat> honestly, like, some like I'm good at math, but like some of the that some of the stuff there was a little like out of my reach. It would have required a lot more time to understand those topics than I felt I was able to invest at that time. And um, the reason that I didn't feel like I was able to invest that amount of time is because I was trying to be a musician. I was trying to be both. I was trying to study jazz. I was trying to network on the scene, whatever. Um, so then economics, um, the, the ideas were easier for me to grasp and the studying was easier and it felt like a more natural combination of, uh, disciplines yeah. to, to, to have under my belt economics and, and music, like knowing full well that I would eventually be my, like an, my own entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, so I, it's kind of a, like a, I, like I remember when I graduated, I was kind of bumped because I was one, I started the economics major um, when I was a junior and I, and I graduated with one class shy of the major. So I guess I could always come back, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, won. <laughs> I was about to say, Hey, maybe just do it then. Like one yeah. semester. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Maybe maybe during the pandemic is the best way best way to do it. I don't know. You can say yeah, maybe maybe in general. Well, you write a lot, man. Like you write so much, um, and I feel like I feel like you and Benny are both releasing stuff all the time. Like with season swing greetings, and also I, I want to talk about your first record um, at some point uh, because I was checking that out yesterday, and I was like, man, these are like really great tunes. And I feel like sometimes the earlier records of people who have made it to like a very like popular and iconic part of a scene, no matter what generation, sometimes the earlier records get buried a little bit because people have this, I think there's like a natural inclination to want to be attracted to what's new. And it's like, oh, I don't want like fear of missing out because there's like this. But um, like whenever I started watching Great British Bake Off, I didn't start at season one, right? I started at like the newest season because I was like, oh, this is like brand new. Um, but it, I feel like you're writing all the time and something that I was going to ask you about already, but somebody mentioned on the Instagram stories was like writer's block and just like creative writing and what that looks like. And I've found that whenever I'm writing in, in a much smaller capacity than, than how you write, um, I, I can't really focus on one tune exactly. I try to have like several different projects going on because if I try to just finish something for the sake of finishing it, it I feel like more often than not, whether lyrically or musically speaking, it's going to be contrived. Um, so whenever you're experiencing that writer's block, do you try to have multiple projects you work on at once? Or are you like, no, I'm gonna zero in on this and however long it takes to finish it, that's how long it's gonna take and then I move on to the next thing. Um, well, thanks for the kind words about the record and, um, you know, you mentioned season swing greetings and all that stuff. Um, so thanks for checking all that out. Yeah, um, course, I do write and I'm constantly writing and writer's block is just a natural part of that process that one has to embrace and understand is natural, you know? Yeah. Um, 
So I don't get too hung up on getting stuck. Like if I get stuck in writer's block um, for my own stuff, I should clarify. Yeah. Like I just leave it be and don't, you know, touch it, like go. I love to run. Mm -hmm. Actually right now my Achilles is injured, so I can't run, but like, so now I'm doing other forms of exercise. <laughs> That's okay. neither here nor there. Right. Um, so like I go and do something else and then I'll return to it. But part of my job, most of my job actually is writing and arranging for people. So when I'm doing those kinds of gigs, writer's block is not an option. Yeah. I ha you have to, you have to be able to like push through, um, and composition and arranging, like there's a lot of composition involved in arranging, but, uh, I, I like to break music up into five different um, parts, right? There's rhythm, then there's melody, there's harmony, then there's arrangement, then there's orchestration. And that's kind of like, that's not a hierarchy in terms of what order things need to be written in, but that's kind of a hierarchy in terms of what order we hear things in. Yeah. Um, so um, rhythm, right? Say like you have the beginning of Donna Lee, for example, right? The melody is... And then yada yada yada, right? Yeah. But like, without rhythm, that melody is just a clump, right? Right. So rhythm implies the passage of time. And then next up on the list is melody, right? Melody is the thing that we sing. Mm -hmm. um, whatever note that is, right? We have that note. Um, and then harmony colors the melody, right? Harmony tells us how the melody feels, right? So it could be this. It could be this could be this right but at the end of the day like we're still seeing that melody note. um and then so that's up to harmony and then we have arrangement arrangement is order of events right and that's where i come in for a lot of people is like arrangement and orchestration so i figure out the order of events that happens in a performance um and so those top three things the rhythm the melody and the harmony mm -hmm. are all taken care of and i can alter certain things depending on who the project is for, especially yeah. if it's for me. Sure. Um, but those three parts are like really integral parts of the DNA of the music. So if you're gonna, when I'm a write, a, arranging or writing or orchestrating for someone, all I have to worry about pretty much is those bottom two things and like maybe occasionally reharmonize something. Yeah. Um, so writer's block not being an option is kind of easier to handle in that capacity. For sure. So your question about what do you do when you have writer's block, like if you're talking about composition for yourself, ultimately, unless you have a record date coming up, right. you do kind of have an unlimited amount of time. But that can also be a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Right. Without a deadline, you can pretty much continue working on things, perfecting, quote unquote, perfecting things until you're 100 percent satisfied. Yeah. But if you're anything like me, like you'll never be 100% satisfied. There, are, there will always be right. things to to change, to alter, to like slightly improve here, slightly improve there. Um, so what I've learned over time is that composition is a snapshot of where I am musically. Yeah. Um, at a, at a certain point in time, um, and that is based off of how I'm feeling. That's based off of things that have happened in my life. That's based off of where I am, like physical location. Yeah. It can even be based on like what piano I'm using. Like this thing is pretty sharp. Um, and there's just so many different, or it can be based off of like what I'm listening to or who I'm talking to. Um, yeah. There's a million, month, so so composition really is a snapshot of where I'm, where I am, who I am at a certain moment in time. Man, I'm so, so yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, just, just to cap that off, just to say, like, co by committing to understanding that this isn't the last thing that I'm going to write, yeah. I'm able to say, okay, imperfect is fine. Yeah, for sure. Right. And that in that way, I'm able to embrace the writer's block and say, well, this isn't just, this isn't a big deal. It's just a piece. Yeah. And get it out and move on. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm so glad that you said that about uh, a snapshot in time. That's something that um, after I had put out a couple records, I, I, I really focused on the first and second where I was like, these have to be, well, the first one was really more of just like, 
I was 19. I wanted to get some stuff out there. I wanted, you know, I wanted something to be able to show for myself if I was going to go and try to cold call and get gigs. You know, it's really hard sometimes in some markets to get gigs if you're like, oh yeah, I have a SoundCloud. It's like, well, cool. So does everybody else, you know, in the world. But um, I then on the second record, I was like, oh, it's got to be perfect. And I spent so much time. And then, and then after a certain point, I was like, this is, why am I toiling over this? It's not like I'm going to go back in the studio. Like, it sounds fine. I'm not going to go back in the studio and like pay another several thousand dollars to just like tweak a couple things. Why not just like get this out there? That was what it was. It's now eight months after we recorded the session and I'm still toiling over mixing. Why not put that energy into the next project? Right. And just have that be like representative of where I was at, at, this year or like this semester or things like that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, do you, are you open or have you even thought of the idea of like, if you wrote a tune and then you recorded it and then maybe there was something that you were like, mm, I didn't like where this went so much, maybe several records from now, I'll tweak it and do like a different arrangement and re-record that tune. Cause it's not unheard of for jazz musicians to record the same tune once, twice, three times in their career. Um, do you think that's a worthwhile thing of like going back and revisiting certain tunes in a different way that are more akin to where you're at at that point in time? Or is it just like, no, always be moving forward. There's too many tunes, we gotta get to all of them or as many as possible. Um, well, I have multiple arrangements of Caravan. Um, I have one for my septet, I have one for my big band and I have one for a string quartet that I wrote. Mm -hmm. And then I have two arrangements of my favorite things. It sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not. Like, no, no, not at all. I don't know why it sounded like that to me, but it just, it just did. I mean, I just love those songs. And yeah. so, like, whatever. Um, <laughs> weird, like, I had a roommate in college who would say, weird brag, dude. But I was like, <laughs> weird Steve. So yeah, but like I have curators of my favorite things, like one for my big band, and then I have one that I wrote for um for a quintet band with a singer called um and it's like the song's a winter band, and so that's like it's just like featuring the singer versus featuring. So that and then I have um you know it's interesting you brought up Peace and Time and my new record, Kinetic, that's coming out. Um I re-orchestrated my arrangement of Nika's Dream. Okay. Um my septet record for my big band and I didn't change the arrangement so much um just the orchestration I did I did change like a couple things but they're pretty small yeah and then I I I, I just you know Andrew Gould is the lead alto saxophonist of my band and he also has really he was really helping me as like a co-producer on the on the record um yeah. alongside Andy Farber um just like to have an extra set of ears and in some cases, eyes in the studio. And so like, I really, really wanted to, and I love how he plays on that too, and on my set record. So I really wanted to feature him on a, on the big band album for like, in like a big way. So he's featured on Wolong Kong. And for that one, I did like change the arrangement quite significantly, added some different grooves here and there. Um, so I do think that, you know, if there's a reason to return to a song, then, you know, why not do it? Yeah. Um, and then, um, but I also think that there's value in like not getting stuck on the same songs, you yeah. know? So. Yeah, totally agree, man. Um, well, speaking about peace and time, um, there's one that I specifically listened to again this morning. I was checking it out yesterday and listened again this morning and I was like, man, this is, such a hauntingly beautiful tune, but I feel like there's a lot of, um, at least in my interpretation, a lot of conflicting emotions that work together in this kind of really heartbreaking way. And it was, am I still there for you? Uh, yeah, I knew that was the word where you were going with that. <laughs> okay, interesting. So, so because there, there is such a feeling at certain times where it's a little bit more dark and solemn, but then and this was what made me really, really excited and happy to be listening to it uh, was like, it felt like the rhythm section was, was providing and the chordal instruments were providing one kind of vibe and the horns were the, the source of the dichotomy uh, where it felt like maybe there was like a little bit more 
positivity or, or maybe not positivity, but hopefulness, because I think even in something being solemn, there can still be positivity, uh, but acknowledging the emotions that associate that you can associate with it. But I'm so curious about you and in your composing for your original tunes, where you're pulling these emotions from. And if it's profoundly personal and you're like, mm, I'd rather keep that here, that's fine. <laughs> But um, where, where does that come from? Like specifically with that tune, what were you thinking about? Yeah, I mean, that title doesn't really hide very much. That's like my first breakup song that I ever wrote. Uh -huh. um, you know, I got dumped and I wrote that song and kind of sad. Uh, I was very sad when I wrote it. And so I think that a lot of the emotions like come through. <clears throat> in that way and as far as the orchestration you know about like you know the dichotomous nature uh between the horns and the rhythm section like i think that that can be answered more in terms of the craft of composing and, and or music in general right like music in general as musicians like we have to think about both things we have to think about how are we going to like deeply connect to ourselves and what we're feeling in our hearts and communicate that to an audience and then in communicating it to an audience and in communicating it to ourselves even, or just like getting it out of ourselves, we have to then think about the technical part of things and the craft and say like, okay, well, as a pianist, like I need to practice my scales, I need to practice my chords, like I need yeah. to know what chord I, what voicing to play in this moment, or like C sharp, half, I think that's the first chord in that piece. Mm -hmm. I, it's been forever since I've played that. Um, <clears throat> right, but then like as far as the dichotomous nature, like the positivity, like, you know, with every, every ending comes a new beginning, yeah, something like that, let's say. Sure. Um, <laughs> so like I always want to like orchestrate in such a way that everybody in the band is contributing something else, right? So I'm not thinking of the horns as an extension of the piano. I'm thinking of the horns each as individual voices and like sometimes they work together, but sometimes they're playing counter melodies. And even in just a septet, you know, the instrumentation that I used on that record was trumpet, alto, tenor, and guitar for the horn section. Sure. Guitar kind of played the role of the jazz French horn, let's say, okay. where he can play a, as a part of the rhythm section and as a part of the horn section. Yeah. But I'm really just trying to think of ways to like give everybody something to do. That's that that is both clear and um, unique and sure. um, conducive to a team presenting a unified message for sure um and again like i would return to those five elements of music where you have rhythm melody harmony right the harmony is repetitive at first so that kind of gets us into some like lulls us into some sort of vibe like some sort of space you get used to a modality which is kind of like dark and then you have a melody that is pretty wandering that like in that song anyway like doesn't ever really resolve on beat one Like, and there's motifs in there that wander like back to where it starts. And that's not something that I thought about. Like I, I, I actually interviewed Brian Kroc for my own podcast at some point and his, the theme that of the day just wound up being like, don't analyze yeah. what he meant. That's a, a song that he has on his record, um, Big Heart Machine, don't analyze. And it's kind of a note to himself where he says like, don't analyze yourself as you're writing because that's going to get in the way of your writing process. So right. this is all stuff that I've realized after the fact. Like when I sat down to write that piece, like I wasn't thinking about anything in particular. Yeah. I was just like, here's Steven at, in 2010 at the piano, like blah, you yeah. know, and like that came out, you know, and like it didn't come out like, like, like writing an essay like every sent like sentence right after the other like you know it took like a couple of days to craft the piece yeah um i hope that answers your question oh it absolutely does and more man like and the thing is is that i'm so curious i think obviously composing and arranging and just creating is so profoundly personal um that i I just have such a curious mind about what that process looks like for, for each person um, and how like life experience can influence that because some people like 
to keep that entirely separate, but some people really like to pull from from this life experience. And I think that I'm I'm of the camp of the latter, right? Where um, if I've had a profoundly like amazing experience, uh, like on my first record, like a Nightingale sang in Barclay Square, I was like the person who I've been with uh, for the past five years, obviously I didn't didn't write that tune. Uh, everyone knows that. Uh, but uh, the person who I've been with for the past like five plus years, that I recorded that tune three days after our first date. And I was like, everything feels so good. So it, it just felt very like, it felt very conducive. It felt very like appropriate, right? Um, and another one that I really, really enjoy uh, that I wanted to ask you about is 3.23 AM, right? I love the idea of space and and a little bit more like like darker colors, right? You might be sensing a theme of of maybe my my uh, my interests as as a musician. You like, you like breakup songs? Oh, oh, is that another breakup song? <laughs> the same, yeah, it's the same one, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Well, I like yeah. your breakup songs. I don't really like Taylor Swift's breakup songs. And that's where we get a whole <laughs> section of the viewers leaving now. Um, but yeah, like, because I don't know, like something that speaks to me a lot is, is whenever there's, there's a lot of space and a lot of like kind of haunting, very, to a certain extent, ambiguous um, uh, 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 emotional content, um, like peace, peace to me, right, is very, very impactful. And I wrote like an original melody over that uh, for my most recent record, um, because I just thought that that motif really allows you to, to play with a lot of ideas, both melodically and lyrically. Um, and I also noticed on the, the questions that you had, um, that you said that you've only written one tune with lyrics. Um, and before I ask you about that, I'm sorry, I'm a little over the place. I'm, I'm very interested in your music and just have all these questions. So going back to 323, you said it was a breakup song, but um, what what about the title was like indicative of like the the musical idea that you wanted to portray? Uh, was it just like everything sucks? Now it's just the time. Now it's just the time that it happened. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't. That's when I wrote it. it. Okay. No. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, simple answer. <laughs> so, so now moving on to the the tune that you have written lyrics for that I guess is not released yet. Um, in your lyric writing, do you like things to be a little bit more um, a little bit more straightforward, a, a little less of kind of like I don't know if riddleistic is a word, but less less like a riddle, or do you like things that? air on the side of like beat poets like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, where it's like a little bit more, you should, you should have notes in an espresso as you're reading the lyrics type thing. How did you know I love espresso? <laughs> <laughs> it was a good, um, guess. good guess. Um, this particular song is full of riddles. Um, Yeah, the song is full of riddles. My song is full of riddles, but I, I haven't written any. I've never, I haven't really challenged myself ever to write songs with lyrics. This one just kind of came out. <clears throat> um, but there are, I mean, I like, I mean, I don't know. I like charming lyrics. I like funny lyrics. I like witty lyrics. I like simple lyrics. I yeah. like rhyming lyrics. I like soft sounding words. I like, um, you know, I like New York in June. Uh, I was about to say, it sounds like you're ripping lyrics from an alternate version of uh, my favorite no, thing. Right I, but I learned lyrics. I learned lyrics to, to all the songs that I know. Um, yeah. You know, I love the lyrics at the last stanza of I Remember You. And when the angels ask me who, you know, to recall the thrill, of the greatest all. thrill of them all, then I'll remember you. Like, that's yeah. amazing. Wow. Yeah. You know, and then... And then like the way that the melody dances around that lyric, like, you know, when when the angels ask me, you know, and they like ask me to recall, and then it goes up again, the the thrill of them all. 
Yeah. Then yeah. I will tell them I remember you or I remember you. My yeah. singing is not great, but my no my man. Knowledge, I mean the lyric and the melody is informing my playing at all times yeah um, so that's one example um of like a soft word that i really like um i mean i also like uh you know one of my favorite records is swing easy which is a frank sinatra record it's the mm -hmm. second record that he ever released on capital but it's the first that he ever recorded okay. i think that the second one he recorded was close to you and more um, which is with the Hollywood String Quartet, and that's the first one that they ever released. Yeah. Um, and both are arranged by Nelson Riddle, and it's like I'm a huge Nelson Riddle fan. I love Frank. I love Nelson Riddle. I love that duo. And then, I mean, I also love Sammy D and um, Marty Page Orchestra. Like that record. I mean, I, I, all of those those records are just like there's so many things about them that make them beautiful whether it's the songs, beautiful melodies, beautiful harmonies, beautiful lyrics, beautiful performances, beautiful arrangements, beautiful orchestrations. Um, yeah, but that record, Swing Easy, holds a very special place in my heart. And I think that it's because of the collection of songs and the order in, in which they're presented, as well as the lyrics on all of them and how Nelson Riddle's orchestrations dance around them. Yeah. So. Even though in my own songs, like I've only written one, so that's a pretty small sample size. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I, but like those are things that I can imagine taking into account in future compositions. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I I tend to be a little bit more attracted to the things that are um, uh, seem a little bit more like riddles and and seem a little bit more involved because um, I think in that way there's more to there's more to chew on, right? There's more that you can get into over time and the lyrics will, will yield different revelations um, uh, over time as, as you listen to it over and over and you really start to put yourself in the mindset of what that composer, or what that singer, what they were doing, a uh, uh, lyricist was doing. Um, but then again, I, you can't say anything about like nobody can say anything bad about John Hendrix, you know, and like this simplicity of like some of his lyrics and, and, you know, Cole Porter was, you know, Cole Porter wrote very few love songs. I don't know if anybody knows that, but no, like he wrote, wrote so many love songs with like really uh, uh, kind of not necessarily on the nose lyrics, but they weren't particularly deep they were just romantic and genuine and heartfelt. I think that also speaks volumes. Um, another thing, and, and also I want to be respectful of your time. I have a couple more questions, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do a speed round. Okay, great. So imposter syndrome, it is so difficult to, to uh, navigate. Uh, but do you find like we, us looking at you, like musicians here in Austin or different smaller scenes, looking at people like you and Alexa and Benny and Dan and Martina Da Silva, we just see like, okay, they sure they have like these, this feeling of imposter syndrome, but we have to assume that it, it is less because of the position that you're in, in the scene. But do you feel like the imposter syndrome gets worse, better, or stays the same as you start to progress higher up uh, on the ladder? Um, I have to say, I don't think I've ever really been afraid of imposter syndrome mm. on a personal level. Um, and some of my musical comrades, um, I've been happy when I've heard them sound like someone who I know that they or could guess that they admire. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, man, that line was like exactly like something Freddie would play. Yeah. Or like, wow, the way you played that ballad, like the bridge, that sounded exactly like, you know, Johnny Hodges or, or some, you know, For that's sure. not a bad thing in my opinion. So like, does imposter syndrome get better or, or worse? Like to me, I don't, really know if I would ask the question in that way. I would maybe say that like your identity as a human being and also as a musician is a collection of your experiences and your decisions. Um, 
that's all life is really is a collection of decisions that point you in different directions. Some are predictable, others are unpredictable. Um, And your soul, your individuality will point you in the direction that you, if you allow it to, will point you in the direction that you need to go in. Yeah. Um, So as far as musical identity goes, um, you know, like my favorite pianists are like Herbie Hancock, McCoy Tyner, Wynton Kelly, Bill Evans, Bud Powell. Like those are the old school guys. I mean, I love Hank Jones, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, um, Cedar Walton, geez, I mean, Thelonious Monk. All of these people I've listened to and like tried to transcribe or literally have transcribed. And then like, you know, the next generation of people or, you know, whatever, like those are all parts of who I am as a musician. And so am I an imposter for sounding like them at times or am I just the next level of the meta? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. Like that imposter syndrome, has, I've never thought about it in, in that sort of way. Um, uh, that said, like, I do understand why, you know, on one search for individuality and for uniqueness that like you would be afraid, one might be afraid of yeah. sounding too much like someone else. Um, not a big deal to me. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's that's definitely comforting. Um, uh, the second to last question is if there's a record that you're like, you know, could just be something that you really enjoyed this week or your all time favorite, what's like the record that you'd go listen or that you'd tell people like go listen to right now? Um, well, I've been listening to this record like pretty much on repeat throughout quarantine, which is um, a Bob Brookmeyer record called Jazz Bing. Big band Graz. Okay. Um, that's pretty dope record. Um, I can also, I want to like throw it up to a couple of contemporaries. Like I mentioned, Brian Kroc, um, Mio Hazama has an incredible record out. It's not super new, but it's not super old either. Sure. Um, Callum Mao is an amazing uh, arranger, orchestrator, and composer from uh, England. And he has a record out called Songs and Stories. Okay. Um, with a singer named, uh, I forget her name. Why am I forgetting her name right now? I'm even in my Spotify. I don't know. Anyway, Holger Mariama has a great new trio record out called Mostly Standards. Okay. Um, Charlie Rosen has a great new record out called Backwards Compatible with yeah, the yeah. Big Band. That's really great. Um, Jim McNeely is my former professor. He, his trio record, Winds of Change, is amazing. His big band record with um, the a- HR or Frank Hurt Radio big band called Barefoot Dances and Other Visions is pretty insane. Um, Jerry Mulligan and the Concert Jazz Band Live at the Village Vanguard, which has a lot of writing by Al Cohen on it, also featuring Clark Terry on, on trumpet. That's great. Mel Torme swings Schubert Alley, um, mm-hmm. Marty Page Orchestra. Um, Emma Cohen has a new record coming out um, soon. The single that he's been dropping, Future Stride, that's great. Benny's record, most recent record, A Lot of Living to Do is really awesome. Um, I mean, I don't know, I can keep going on and on, but you know, I mean, Emmanuel Wilkins, um, I think the record's called Omega. These are all records that I listen to. I love listening to my peers and like being inspired by what other people are doing. Um, Just as much as I love going back and listening to old records yeah that's man that's a really great point i think sometimes people can feel a little guilty for listening to the new stuff when they haven't listened to enough of the old stuff but it's like there needs to be that balance right because if we're only focused on the old and not like really diving into what people are creating now like they, you know they weren't going back and just listening to themselves and listening to like all the other but then again those were the their contemporaries right and their, their peers yeah yeah they're com- exactly yeah yeah. Um, and then the last question that I have for you is um, we all have gigs from hell uh, and where things just go like crazy up the wall. And these stories have been crazy, man. We've had from like somebody being held by the cartel to like somebody being shot at like uh, in the middle of a club date. 
Um, it just really has run the gamut of, of craziness. Um, no pressure at all. Just but what, what can you think of as like, whew, that was a particularly weird one. Kidnapped by the cartel. That is intense. Um, I'm sorry to whoever that was. Yeah, they were, they were playing. Yeah, they were playing a gig at their like mansion. And then uh, it wasn't like particularly violent. It was just like, keep playing. We're not going to let you leave. Like, we want you to just keep playing big band music all night. So, um, but yeah, wow. still scary. That's very scary. scary. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how proud of myself I am for this, but there was one gig I had when I first graduated college. And um, I was playing, it was like a, it was like a bar gig, but like a nice bar, like with a stage. Um, and I was playing duo with a trumpet player and basically they shut off the piano sound on stage, off stage. And I, was, I couldn't hear myself playing. So I just said like, hey, I like, can you turn me up on stage at least so I can hear myself please? And they're like, no, it's too loud. I was like, I'm literally all the way off. Uh and, and they were like, and they were like, well, that's okay. Like, we don't, that's, that's fine. We don't need you to play. And I was like, uh, okay, well, then I think I'm going to go. And they're, they're, they're like, no, don't go. I was like, yeah, I'm going. And it's the only gig ever that I've walked out of. Um, yeah. But everybody has a line. And yeah. mine went across when they turned off the sound entirely. So there was no sound, not even in the house of the piano. Yeah, no, they just, just wanted to hear the trumpet. No, they just, they asked him to stop playing as well. They just wanted the wallpaper. Oh my God. All right. Well, did you get paid? Uh, no, I, I mean, no, I didn't. I oh, just man. Well, then that I just up and walked, walked, you know. That's fine then. Woo. Man, Stephen, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> many years ago. For sure. Well, hopefully that never happens again. I don't think anybody in the right <laughs> mind would do that to you again. But Stephen, thanks so much for coming on and having an extended chat, man. And uh, thank you. So much. Oh, great to be here. Yeah, of course. And hope to see you guys up there when it's safe in the not too distant future. Yeah, maybe by the, ne the next Jazz Congress. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, man. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Talk to you right. later. Bye.